Morning. How's everybody? Good. Welcome. Happy Women's History Month. Yes. Welcome to MLK Library. If this is your first time or you've been here many times, we're happy to see you. My name is Diana Vega and I am the Civic Engagement Coordinator for DC Public Library. And we are excited to have Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III here. Yeah, woohoo! Yes, you can clap now. He's going, it's going to be a very, um, can I say, informal time joining, but he's going to provide a lecture on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the influences from his childhood that pushed Dr. King to be civically engaged and a social justice advocate. Dr. Moss will be using his latest book, Dancing in the Darkness, Spiritual Lessons for Thriving in Turbulent Times, as guide and inspiration tonight. And we want to thank the DCPL Foundation for purchasing copies of Reverend Moss' book that we've been able to give to you tonight and so immediately after this program Reverend Moss will sign your book so stick around so this lecture was originally scheduled for MLK week but was postponed due to circumstances beyond our control but it's now our kickoff event for civic learning week DC, DCPL is celebrating Civic Learning Week, which is officially from March 11th through 15th this year and is hosted annually by iCivics and seeks to highlight the importance of civic education in sustaining and strengthening constitutional democracy in the United States. And we are putting our own spin on things by incorporating our 50 years of home rule celebration into Civic Learning Week. Yes. Yes. And we know now more than ever, libraries play a pivotal role in being a place where people can seek information and have important conversations around these issues. Next week, we will celebrate Civic Learning Day on Thursday, March 15th. March 14th, excuse me, with a DC government agency resource fair where almost 20 government agencies will be on site to provide information about their programs and their resources, et cetera. That will run from 3 to 7 p.m. Then immediately following the fair at 7 p.m., we'll be right back here for This Is What Democracy Looks Like storytelling show provided by Story District. We'll hear true stories that delve into real life situations and events that highlight the principles of democracy, its challenges, and the diverse ways people engage in it. The stories cover various topics such as grassroots movements, citizen activism, electoral processes, community organizing, and the power of collective action. So come back and join us next Thursday for Civic uh, learning Day, Civic Learning Week, and all that. So now I will introduce our moderator and featured speaker for tonight. Our moderator is Reverend Thomas L. Bowen, who serves as the Senior Advisor for Public Engagement at the White House. So we're lucky we got him tonight, because it's a big thing happening up the street tonight. He holds the esteemed position of Earl L. Harrison, Minister of Social Justice at the historic Shiloh Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., where he has been actively involved since 2002. Previously, he served as the Director of African American Strategic Engagement in the Executive Office of D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, overseeing initiatives such as the Mayor's Office on African American Affairs and the Mayor's Office of Religious Affairs. Reverend Bowen, affectionately known as D.C.'s pastor, brings a wealth of advocacy experience, including roles at the Children's Defense Fund. A graduate of Morehouse College and a Ford Foundation scholar, yeah, he pursued his studies in ministry at the Divinity School, University of Chicago. Originally from Lorain County, Ohio, Reverend Bowen has called DC home for over 20 years and currently resides in the historic Trinidad neighborhood in Northeast. And it is important to note he is here in his personal capacity and his views are his own and not those of the White House or an endorsement. Our feature speaker for this evening 
is Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III. With civil rights advocacy in his DNA, Reverend Moss III built his ministry on community advancement and social ju justice activism. As senior pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, Dr. Moss spent the last two decades practicing and preaching a black theology that unapologetically calls attention to the problems of mass incarceration, environmental justice, and economic inequality. Dr. Moss is a part of a new generation of ministers committed to preaching a prophetic message of love and justice. A native of Cleveland, Ohio, Dr. Moss is an honors graduate of Morehouse College. He earned a Master of Divinity from Yale Divinity School and a Doctor of Ministry from Chicago Theological Seminary with a unique gift to communicate, communicate across generations. Dr. Moss is a popular speaker on college campuses, at conferences, and churches across the globe. He's highly influenced by the works of Zora Neale Hurston, August Wilson, Howard Thurman, jazz, and hip hop music. The work and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the pastoral ministry of his father, Reverend Dr. Otis Jr. of Cleveland, Ohio, have been primary mentors for his spiritual formation. He has written several books. His sermons and articles have appeared in various publications. He is married to his college sweetheart, the former Monica Brown of Orlando, a Spelman College and Columbia University graduate, and they are the proud parents of two creative and humorous children, Elijah and Michaela. So please help me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III to the podium, to the stage. Yes. Enjoy. Thank you. First, I want to take this moment to say thank you to the DC Public Library for, for this opportunity and, and to return. Originally was planned to be here uh, during the MLK uh, weekend, uh, but unfortunately there's something that is real around here. It is called COVID. It is called COVID. I had COVID and it was no, no way that I could be here in DC. And I'm just so grateful to my cousin, to my cousin. I claim her as my cousin. Uh, Sister Vega, we appreciate her. I claim her mama as my auntie. Um, first, when I met her, I said, you my auntie. I just want you to know that from now on, we are family. And so I'm just so very grateful, and it is an absolute delight uh, to be here. And I have to give a shout out. It's already been introduced, none other than my brother, uh, Reverend Thomas Bowen, who is such an incredible gift. I remember arriving on the campus at Morehouse, and there were these brothers that we, we looked up to. And Thomas Bowen was one of them. And then I found out that he was from Ohio. And I said, oh, he's all right. He's definitely all right uh, coming from Ohio. But he is an incredible gift, not only to DC, but he mentors so many people across this nation. And I just want to say publicly, Tom, that you have been a blessing in my life and in the life of so many other people. And it's always an honor to, to share a stage with you, my brother. And I thank God that you are working with the Biden administration. You are an answer to a lot of prayers. Amen, that you are working with, with the Biden administration. And I've got to give a shout out also to my Shiloh family that is, that is here. Uh, Shiloh has claimed me uh, ever since I was small, and I just appreciate them so very much and just so very honored. And there is one of my favorite preachers on this planet is here, uh, Minister Mahogany. It is so good to see you. She served as an intern at Trinity. And she is now working for Bread for the City, does an amazing job. If you have not heard her preach, you need to hear this sister preach. She is absolutely, absolutely gifted. But I want to take this, this time that we have uh, uh, today, this evening, to talk about Dr. King from a very different perspective. Uh, many times when we talk about uh, Dr. King, we, we place him on a pedestal as if there was no one else that was doing any work during the movement. As a matter of fact, there were really, as I heard one person put it, one scholar said, at the height of the civil rights movement, you had about 1,500 organizers who shifted literally the social landscape of, of America. 
And one of my professors and teachers is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Vincent Harding. Uh, he was a scholar, also the editor uh, for Dr. King for many of his, his messages. And much of what I want to share comes from sitting at the feet of Dr. Vincent Harding. There's a tremendous book that he created. I would encourage you, if, if it's still in print, it is entitled Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., The Inconvenient Hero. The Inconvenient Hero. And he offers several essays in terms of what Dr. King means uh, to this nation and how the hope of this nation is rooted in his radical revolutionary message that in many ways has been sanitized uh, by people who want to stand next to uh, a portion of the legacy uh, for votes but do not necessarily want to embrace the totality of this incredible radical and revolutionary message uh, that was not just birthed through Dr. King, but comes down the line of what some scholars call the black social gospel. So let me begin this way. It is in Dr. Harding's book, The Inconvenient Hero, that he writes and quotes a particular poem, a poem from a poet by the name of uh, Wendell Holmes, who says that after the assassination of Dr. King, he writes his poem and says, now that he is safely dead, let us praise him and build monuments to his glory. Sing hosannas to his name. Dead men make such convenient heroes. They cannot rise to challenge the image we would fashion from their lives. It's easier to build monuments than it is to create a better world. Now that he is safely dead, let us celebrate Dr. King. Not the radical king, but the king that we can mold into an image that keeps the status quo. Now that he is safely dead. It is Wendell Holmes who raises this question that uh, we have sanitized Dr. King and the entire movement on several levels, placed him on a pedestal or high upon a shelf where no matter your particular political perspective, you can pull him down, dust him off every year and say, I support Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's amazing to me that everybody loves him now he's dead. But, but when he was alive, according to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, when they did a survey, that he was the most hated man in the state of Georgia and was also the most dangerous man, according to J. Edgar Hoover, in America. How do we go to this person that everyone loves, but J. Edgar Hoover said he was the most dangerous man? How, how do we go to this moment where everybody wants to lift up Dr. King's name, but no one wants to build the better world that he stood for. How did we get here? Well, one of the things that, that happens with us is that we have a tendency to romanticize history, and we want to isolate personalities, but we don't want to deal with the entire village that built an individual. Dr. King does not come out of isolation. He does not show up like Elijah shows up in the Bible just out of nowhere. Where'd he come from? No, 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 no. Dr. King comes out of a powerful legacy. And I will quote a poet by the name of Anita Scott Coleman, an Afro-Mexican who moved to New Mexico and eventually to Harlem, New York, and became a colleague of someone that everyone here probably has heard of by the name of Langston Hughes. This woman, Anita Scott Coleman, as she was writing about uh, the power and the resilience of black people, she wrote this amazing poem entitled Portraiture that I believe speaks about the community and village that Dr. King comes from. And I changed just one little word, and it simply would go this way. Black people are the tall trees that remain standing in a forest after a fire. Flame strips their branches, flame sears their limbs, flame scorches their trunks, yet stand these trees, for their roots grow deep in the earth. 
black people are the tall trees that remain standing in a forest after a fire. It is Dr. King who comes from an amazing, incredible village of people, people who poured into him from a John Wesley Dobbs to a Alonzo Herndon, uh, from a variety of people who come from that sweet Auburn uh, experience that I will share in a little while. Uh, but he comes out of a community, and there would be no Dr. King unless one knows, if you read Parting the Waters, his forerunner, a gentleman by the name of Reverend Vernon Jordan. Reverend Vernon Jordan, he was born in Lynchburg, uh, Virginia. He came up on a farm. He was what we would call a part of the peonage system, what they call sharecropping. And within Lynchburg, if you were, were black, you only went to school three to four months out of the year, if you were black, because the rest of the year you had to pick some cotton or tobacco. They didn't think that black people had the intellectual capacity and did not need school. But it was Vernon Johns who believed that God had called him not just to preach the gospel, but to be one who would break every ceiling that white supremacy placed above his head. So he decided to do something, uh, Thomas, that was absolutely extraordinary. A young man from a segregated school system decided that he was going to apply to one of the top universities in the United States, Oberlin College. He would go to Oberlin College, and he, he prepared uh, his application for Oberlin. But he also knew, because he came from a segregated school system, uh, that there'd be a possibility that he might not be let in. So what Vernon Johns, uh, George Johns did uh, is what he did is he simply prepared all of his clothes, got his trunk together, and then he hopped on a train and made his way to Oberlin, Ohio. He said, I'm going to do it in such a way that my application will arrive the same day I do. So if you're going to deny me, you better deny me to my face. And so he shows up on the campus of Oberlin. And he says, I'm here to start school. I am Vernon Johns from Lynchburg, Virginia. He's speaking to the dean of students, and he's talking to the dean of students. The dean of students is shuffling papers, trying to figure out, wait a minute here, we've got this, this young man from Virginia. He pulls his application and says, oh, uh, Vernon, um, you don't have enough credits to come here. We were going to deny you. And he then quickly says, with his quick wit, he said, do you want brains or do you want credits? I've got the brains. I may not have the credits. The dean was a little bit upset and said, well, in order for you to enter the school, you do have to speak Greek and read Greek fluently. And based upon what I see here, that, that your school never offered Greek. Vernon John scans the bookcase behind him. He says, is that a Greek book behind you? If I may see it for a moment and then begins to read fluently. And he says again, do you want brains or do you want credits? I'm your man if you want brains. The dean was a little bit upset and said, well, maybe that was a nice trick, but you do have to speak Hebrew fluently and read it fluently. He said, is that not a Hebrew book on the second row right there? Grabs it and begins to read it. And he said again, do you want somebody with brains or do you want somebody with credits? They allow him to enter into Oberlin. He graduates second in his class. Then he is called to a church in Montgomery, Alabama. And there in Montgomery, Alabama, because of his radical nature, he was always preaching a black theology before James Cone even wrote anything about black theology. He, he, he preached one particular sermon, and this is one entitled, uh, such as Heaven Segregated. Another one he, would, he put out on uh, the marquee before he preached it. He says, is it legal to lynch Negroes in Alabama? Now, when the sheriff drove by and saw what he was going to preach on Sunday, they picked up Vernon Johns. He was arrested for a sermon he was about to preach. Now, I don't know about any other preacher that was ever arrested for a sermon you are about to preach. They bring him down to the jail. And they say to him in a disrespectful manner, they say, boy, uh, you need to tell us what you're going to preach on Sunday about this lynching going on here in Alabama. And Vernon, uh, Reverend Vernon Johns begins to scan all of the deputies, all of them who have their hands on their hips and their guns. And he says, I would be delighted to share with you my sermon. 
and he has his hat in his hand. But he said, you must know I'm a Baptist preacher. And before I can preach, I must first take an offering. And at that moment, they begin to laugh. And uh, he was able to escape that moment. But he never stopped preaching these radical messages every single Sunday. He said one, one of his messages goes this way. He said, if you want to see an act of perpetual motion, find a bourgeois Negro and put him in a Cadillac and then ask him to park it on land he owns. He says that there has to be some economic development, building of institutions in order for freedom to come. And every Sunday he irritated the deacons at this church called Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Every single Sunday, there was some message they couldn't stand. Said, he's too radical. And so you know what they did? Uh, the deacons got together and said, we putting him out. They put Vernon Johns out because he was preaching messages that would, he believed would change the social structure of America. And then the deacons got together. They did this, uh, uh, Minister Mahogany, they got together and they said, the next preacher that we call, First, we got to make sure that the preacher's young so we can control him. We don't want one of these radical folks showing up around here. And then one of the deacons said, I know of a young man. He just finished his Ph.D. at Boston, graduated from Morehouse. And then Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came and the guess the rest is history from there. But there would be no Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. if there had never been a Vernon John. He is the one who made a way for Dr. King. And so now Dr. King is in, uh, in Montgomery. He's moved his family there. And there he is just simply going to be a pastor and an intellectual, write some books, and maybe even become the president of Morehouse College was part of the plan at some point. But something happens while he is in Montgomery. While he's in Montgomery, there was already radical people working together to train, change the system. I know we love to lift up a woman by the name of Rosa Parks, who was absolutely amazing and incredible, but we like to lift her up as if she was this meek and mild woman. But the reality is, is that Rosa Parks had been an organizer for years, but she was not the first person to sit down. There was another sister by the name of Claudette Colvin who sat down on the bus because she was challenging a system. But because of, in the words of E. Franklin Frazier, the black bourgeoisie could not see that a woman who was not married and had children could be the one that we could utilize for a case in the Alabama Supreme Court. She was marginalized. And then Rosa Parks is the one who sat down. So if you can imagine with me, if come with me for a moment, I believe it is Holt Street Baptist Church, where they have the organizing meeting about what are we going to do next because Rosa Parks sat down. So all of them, let me, I'm gonna say, and I'm saying it this way particularly, all the men are in the front talking. And the sisters are in the back with their eyes looking like, what y'all doing? The, the brothers and they're arguing, they're arguing. They are saying, well, you know what we need to do? Turn this thing over to the NAACP. Uh, we need to allow the Legal Defense Fund to do the work. The brothers are saying this. And then some are saying, no, we need a boycott. We need a boycott for several days, the, the brothers are saying this. But in the back, uh, there was a group of sisters and organizers led by a woman by the name of Joanne Robinson. Joanne Robinson worked at Alabama State University, but was also the chair of the Women's Political Council. And Joanne Robinson, with about eight other sisters in the back, said, just let the brothers argue. They're going to be here all night. We going over to Alabama State, and we going to start a boycott. We got a mimeograph machine over there. Now, some of you know what a mimeograph machine is. Now, now, Mahogany, I know you've never seen a mimeograph machine before. You're too young. Um, but a mimeograph machine is when you, when you are trying to put out some flyers, you got to crank that thing. You got to crank it. And so they were going to crank out 55,000 flyers and deliver them within eight hours to every black person in Montgomery. And they had gotten paper boys to be the delivery system. They said, we'll deliver the, pa we'll give the papers to the paper boys, they will go to black households, and when the men wake up, they'll realize that a revolution has already started. And so they get out the first 10,000, I believe, they distribute them out to the paper boys, 
One paper boy, as the story goes, walks outside and a breeze, I believe God was working, a breeze comes by and the papers go everywhere. But one of the papers lands upon the car of a person who was a part of the White Citizens Council. That was called the respectable KKK, by the way. So the White Citizens Council, this man sees this paper and he says, oh my goodness, look what the Negroes in Alabama are trying to do. I'm going to go uh, to the head of uh, the Montgomery newspaper, who is also a part of the White Citizens Council. And I'm going to let him know what black people are trying to do in this town. And the editor of the paper says, I can't believe what these black people are trying to do. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to print a full page ad and let all the white people know what the black people are going to do. What he didn't realize that he let all the black people know what they were supposed to do. And so when Dr. King woke up, he realized that he was now head of a movement, the movement that kicks off the transformation of the social landscape of America. Joanne Robinson, Vernon John, all of these people, part of a village network that creates a system because Dr. King is from those people who stand tall in the forest after the fire. So he comes from a village network, but not only the village network. It was the moral imagination that came out of the black community that created Dr. King. Now here we are in Washington, D.C., uh, but if I could take you to Atlanta, Georgia, to a place called Sweet Auburn, and if I could take you down Auburn Avenue to Dr. King's home. Now, many people have been to the home and they look at the home, this middle-class home, but what you must understand, which was so powerful on Auburn Avenue, this, this black neighborhood, which in many ways was modeled off of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was a black Wall Street in Atlanta that had been set up and developed by a person by the name of Alonzo Herndon, who was a sharecropper who comes to Atlanta and becomes a barber. He becomes a barber, but he's a barber in the black community and the white community. And he listened in to all of the business people ear hustling so that he could get some information to set up his own business, which becomes the Atlanta Life Insurance Company, one of the largest black insurance companies that he then sets up a fund for anyone who goes to jail fighting for their rights, we always gonna pay to get you out. That is Auburn Avenue. So here we have Dr. King. Dr. King comes out of his home. It's a middle class home. It's a, it's, it's a lovely home. And on one side of the street are all middle class homes, but not across the street. Across the street are shotgun houses, the houses of the domestics, the houses of the person who is the distributor of coal in the neighborhood. Those were those homes. So on one side, middle class. On the other side, working and underclass. So as soon as he walked out of his home, he was confronted with the complexities of the black community. But then he turns left and decides he's going to walk to his father's church Auburn, uh, and on Auburn Avenue, better known as the Ebenezer Baptist Church. But before he could get to Ebenezer, he had to pass by so much black excellence. He had to walk past the Harbor Brooks funeral home which was the only funeral home that was owned and operated by a black woman in Georgia. So there he saw a black woman that was breaking every ceiling around patriarchy. But after passing the funeral home, he then also had to pass by the, the AME Church right there on Auburn Avenue, the place where Henry McNeil Turner preached and said, God is a Negro. He was hearing black theology before anybody said black theology is black theology. And then when he kept walking, he walked by W-E-R-D, W-E-R-D, Word Radio, a black owned radio station that specifically was lifting up issues around lynching that you tuned in and you found out what was happening in Mississippi and in Arkansas and in Louisiana, it was black owned and it was black operated. 
But not only that, then he passed by Citizens Trust which was a black owned institution that if you wanted to get a home, if you wanted to start a business, you came to Citizens Trust, a black owned uh, financial institution. And then he passed by uh, the Alexander Insurance Firm. Alexander, Ale who is Alexander? The uh, T.M. Alexander, a Morehouse graduate. And T.M. Alexander, when he was in Montgomery, Something happened that was so extraordinary that I, I love this piece of history. It is so beautiful and magnificent. When black people stopped riding the buses, what they started doing is people start carpooling. Black churches would bring their vans and their cars and say, we'll, we'll drive you around. But this is what the White Citizens Council did. They said, if you have more than one person in your car, that meaning the driver, then you are acting as a taxi and we can arrest you. So what they did, they brought T.M. Alexander from Atlanta, and T.M. Alexander tried to underwrite all of the black vehicles from black churches, but not a single insurance company would underwrite it. So what did T.M. Alexander do? He went over to, at that time, it was not Hartsfield, Jackson, it was the Hartsfield Airport, and he got on the plane and he flew to London, and he sat down with the Lloyds of London, and they underwrote the insurance for the cars in Montgomery. Black folk had Uber before Uber knew what Uber was. <laughs> and so they were able to deliver and drive people around and had their insurance at the same time. Dr. King's walking past Alexander, T.M. Alexander's insurance company, still has not gotten to his church. And there he then has to pass by the Wheat Street uh, Baptist Church where William Holmes Borders was the pastor. You have all heard William Holmes Borders and didn't even know it because there is an amazing, gifted uh, politician, minister, and prophet by the name of Reverend, Jack Reverend Jesse Jackson who has been quoting him for the last 40 years. I am somebody. I am somebody, I am a pilot in Bessie Cole. I'm an educator in uh, Booker T, institution builder in Booker T, Washington. I am a writer and educator in W.E.B. Du Bois. I am a singer like Billie Holiday. I mean, I am somebody comes from a poem that was written by William Holmes Borders. Dr. King used to sit in the balcony to listen to Borders before he went over to his father's church. And it was William Holmes Borders in 1948, I believe, no, it was 45, in 1945, where he decided that when they were doing the Atlanta Passion Play, he stood about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six in height. It looked like he should have been a fullback for, uh, for a football team. And they picked Borders to play Jesus in the Atlanta Passion Play. Now, can you imagine, 1945, Yo, Jesus is 6'6", six, six, and looks like he could take out anybody. And say, that's my kind of Jesus right there. So the image that young people had of Jesus, because if you were on Auburn Avenue, this is what you witnessed. All of this moral imagination and black excellence that was happening. And then finally, he made it to his father's church from the door to his church, all of that he experienced. That was the education. It's not Brightman and DeWolf. It is not Niebuhr. It is from that particular community. It is from the Borders and the Alonzo Herndons and the John Wesley Dobbs. It is from the Harbrooks Funeral Home. It is from W.E.R.D. It is from Citizens Trust. It is from all of that. That is who made Dr. King Dr. King. And when then he saw injustice growing up in a community that said, you are just as good, if not better, than somebody else. And then making his way to Morehouse College. As my father said it this way, he had to get on a segregated bus and a segregated streetcar. He said he was sitting in the back, but his mind was always in the front. And then he arrived on the campus and built a relationship with Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays. Many scholars love to lift up what he learned at Boston, love to speak about what he read at Crozier and his uh, focus on dialectical materialism and things of that nature. But you need to go back to Auburn Avenue 
if you really want to find the real theologians who built this man, a community, a village that had moral imagination. A village uh, that built him, moral imagination. And that is how Dr. King, if I may use a phrase from the book, learned how to dance in the darkness in those moments. And that is what, what people of African descent have been doing for America. We, we have been teaching America democracy when America didn't even know what democracy was all about. I love to use the, the, the phrasing and uh, methodology that comes from something known as jazz. That, that jazz music in itself is a music that teaches America democracy before America knew what democracy was all about. The beauty of jazz, as you know, jazz born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Jazz is really a mixture of a variety of traditions. It is a mixture of, of African pentatonic sounds along with uh, Native American indigenous uh, drumming and also singing and humming, along with Spanish and Jewish, along with a French, all of that coming together in that space, what was called the Congo Square led specifically by some Haitian immigrants who came from Haiti and the people were hearing the sounds of a country that was free. All of that was born and then jazz music does something, does something that no other tradition does. Jazz music takes instruments that are not supposed to play together, but yet they play together. You must know that the saxophone was designed specifically for a marching band. The piano is designed specifically uh, for that European classical sound. And when you play the drum, you don't play on a trap drum set, you're supposed to use the one, two uh, rhythm. Uh, but here you have African polyrhythms being played in jazz music. And then the bass, you're supposed to play with a bow, not your fingers. And so all of a sudden, this music, all these instruments that are not supposed to play together. But the beautiful thing about jazz is that everybody in the band has a right to solo. That you can bring your unique cultural perspective to the table and no one tries to shut you down. Because you are working to build the composition collectively. I've never heard in a jazz band where the piano will talk to the saxophone and say, saxophone, you need to sound just like me. You never heard the saxophone demand uh, the drum sound just like me. No, no, no. You never heard the bass say, all y'all need to sound like me. No, everybody has the right to bring their unique cultural perspective to the table. And in the process, a new music is created. I believe that that is what America needs in this moment. We don't need a symphony. We need a jazz band. We need a band where everybody can bring their unique cultural perspective to the table and add something to the mix. But there seems to be a demand where I put it this way. I'm going to say it this way probably when, I, when I'm at Hampton, when I have to do this lecture. I learned this from Jay Dilla. He's one of my favorite producers. That's a whole other story. I'll talk about Jay Dilla at some other point. But, but Jay Dilla, who was a producer, one of the greatest hip-hop producers, he said that he learned something about, about what happens in America, that there are, there's a community of people who clap on one and three. And there's another community that claps on two and four. He said the problem is, is that the most of the world claps on two and four. But Europe is trying to create beat supremacy with the one and three. But the beautiful thing is that when you can clap one and three and two and four, you can build something new in the process. Florida wants everybody clapping on one and three. But there are so many people who are clapping on two and four, and we can bring something new to the table. And America desperately needs a jazz ethic of democracy, a new way to play and see the world. And this is how we dance in the darkness, recognizing uh, the village from which we come from, the tall trees that stand in a forest after a fire. And before we speak about the brilliance of Dr. King, know all of those who surrounded them and the beauty of that sweet Auburn street that nurtured him as a little boy. If we are to learn how to transform, in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, these yet to be United States of America, maybe it will be through a jazz ethic 
that we will learn how to dance in the darkness. God bless you. <laughs>
I heard Julie Dash give a, a presentation. I said, and I had the opportunity to, I was trying to ask some questions. And she said this, she said, the reason that black people look so good in my film, is it's using natural light, is that we couldn't use American film. We had to go to Germany to get the film that was used for the National Geographic because it was designed for nature and it would light us appropriately. And uh, that, that just always fascinated me. So I, I, I went to Morehouse hoping to beautify the beauty of black people. That, that's, that's what I was hoping to do, be a cinematographer. And things radically changed because of the Morehouse experience. One, the chapel, uh, Dr. Aaron Parker uh, was another, and track, track and field. I mean, I was, I was on track scholarship. I was planning to go to the Olympics. I had uh, qualified for the Olympic trials. I was, you know, I, that's, that was going to be my like Edwin Moses. That's a, yeah, that's right. That's a, Ed, Edwin Moses went to, I was like, you can go to do the Olympics from Morehouse. And um, something changed my life, and I think it was God. I got the chicken pox at 19, and I lost 15 pounds, and it destroyed my entire track and field season. I was in the best shape of my life. I was going. We were, we were planning. To, I was going to come to to Philadelphia for for the uh, the pin relays. I was going. To, I was. I was so excited. My career ended. <laughs> pretty much ended as a result. And I was trying to rebuild myself physically and all of this. And I'll never forget that I was doing a warm down. I said, I'm, you know, I was hearing the Rocky theme in my head. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm doing this thing. I'm coming back. And it was the clearest thing that I, I think that had ever happened to me when it was just really an internal voice that said, when are you going to stop running in circles? I'm sitting there going around, I was like, oh my gosh. Um, I had been running from this call a good portion of my life. So I called my girlfriend, who is now my wife, um, and uh, I asked her, I said, will you come over to the track? I, I, I got something to tell you. And um, she thought I was going to ask her to marry her. She's like, I ain't, no, we ain't doing that. She's like, no, mm-mm. <laughs> and then, um, you know, when I told her, I'm being called to ministry, this, that, and the other, she was like, you are the last person to know. <laughs> we knew that. We just waiting for you to figure it out. And so that put me on the path. And I still did not want to go into pastoral ministry. It was, I was trying to think of a way that maybe I will do law. Maybe I'll figure out to do documentary film. I will go to Union and NYU. That was my plan. Uh, that didn't work out. Um, in terms of doing union and, and, and NYU, you ended up at Yale Divinity and all of that. Uh, but, but that was really the moment that, that Morehouse and having people, that's the importance of an HBCU, of having people who invest in you, not because they're paid to, but because they see something in you. And, 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 and that was the great blessing uh, in, in my life was that experience at, at Morehouse and having the opportunity to, uh, to be connected with such people. So you mentioned in your talk, Walter Rauschenbusch's The Social Gospel, yes. and then you append to it the Black Social Gospel, and you grew up at Olivet Institutional mm -hmm. Baptist Church, very much <laughs> yeah. steeped in that tradition. Mm -hmm. Trinity, where you are now, was a, was a pillar. In the, in the black community in Chicago, they had an AIDS ministry when people were running away from people mm -hmm. uh, with, with, with AIDS. Um, do, do you see that the need uh, now to discover, rediscover that tradition? Because that tradition is one in which people, the church, met people where they were. Mm -hmm. and th there has always been a prophetic, what we call the prophetic stream of the black church. When I say prophetic, I'm not talking about thinking into the future. We're talking about like the prophets. The prophets always spoke truth to power, or the way that I love that one professor, I'll never forget the way that this person put it, said that priests speak to God on behalf of the people. The prophet speaks to the people on behalf of God. They said that's how you always understand the two. And the black prophetic tradition has always been about black flourishing. But black flourishing is always about everybody flourishing. And that's the beautiful thing about our tradition, that we never marginalize. It, 
all communities benefit when black folk do well. Let me just put it that way. Um, and we have never not included um, someone's particular benefits as a result of, of, of our work. The prosperity gospel, because of televangelists' ability to get on television, obscured this prophetic wing. And, and I had a conversation. I was sitting at the Progressive National Baptist Convention. There was, it was my father, it was Jesse Jackson, it was uh, Billy Kyles, who was one of the last people who was with, with Dr. King when he was assassinated. Uh, it was several other ministers. J. Alfred Smith, um, I think Gardner Taylor might have been in that, no, he wasn't in, in that conversation. But I heard them, I was listening to them all talk. And I said to J. Alfred Smith, Charles Adams too, he was there. And um, I said to these, all these, these men, I said, you know what? If you all had been on television in the 70s, Creflo Dollar wouldn't be a model of ministry today. You chose radio because you thought there was something wrong with being on TV and things of that nature. But could you imagine if Charles Adams was on TV in 1975? if J. Alfred Smith in California was on television, if Carolyn Knight was on tele, if all of these people had been on TV in the 70s and 80s, that would, the, the black social gospel would be the normative way in which people view ministry. But we turned it over to, how should, I'm trying to be nice, um, <laughs> to, People who had, who called themselves charismatics, who stole black Pentecostalism and used black music and black rhythm of speech, but have no, let me put it this way, when you make gumbo, you need a good roux. These are folks who, are, who have a theology with no roux. So it has no flavor. Um, it has no base and has no bottom, but it has some, it has pinches of black isms, but it's not black. It's the appropriation of our stuff. And, and the dollars and the other pe and people in that vein really come out of that and don't come out of the prophetic wing. Mm -hmm. And right now, you know, we, we need people who speak out of that black social gospel realm. And, and, and people are doing it. I mean, people are de definitely doing it. But because of the 80s and 90s wing of, of prosperity ministry, when people think of churches, they think of that. Not knowing that there is another tradition that has been knocking down walls since 1619. And we've got to reclaim what is inherent within our tradition. So today there's, there's much mentioned that uh, this generation of young black people who are walking away from the church, and I'm quick to point out to people that you cannot judge spirituality and religion by how many times a month you go to church. You, you'll lose a brunch every time. Um, I know that your church uh, receives a lot of uh, young people. We have New Bethel. Uh, here, pastor by Reverend Dexter Nuttall, who I was there one Sunday, and 40 people, 40 young people joined uh, the church on, on a Sunday. In your book, you dedicate uh, this particular one to your daughter, Michaela, who you said taught you how to dance in the dark. What have you learned from young people? What could we learn from young people? Uh, sometimes our, our mentors are younger than we are. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. See, I got one out here, right here, you see. Um, but the power of, of one, imagination, the ability to, to critique in love, and the, what I would call the improvisational um, impulse, meaning we can do this differently. We don't have to always hit the same beats, and, and that's what I, I learned, for example, um, uh, Reverend Melick Thomas, he, he recently, he gave a shout out to Glorilla in one of his sermons, 
Um, if y'all, I didn't say gorilla, glorilla, by the way, so y'all are confused. Anyway, look it up. Anyway, Google. Google, Google, Google. Um, and this went viral. He ended up on the Breakfast Club and things of that nature. And Glorilla ends up uh, tweeting out, you know, that she just so appreciated what was said and just became this kind of moment. Uh, but that kind of amazing creativity to be able to, uh, to, to communicate. And I just love listening, hearing, witnessing the incredible creativity and brilliance of this generation. Leaving church doesn't mean leaving God. They are creating new spaces in which worship and devotion and reflection and, and understanding are being created. And, and I'm excited about it. Every generation does that. So for my father and mother's generation, there was a group that was doing the same thing. Uh, they were part of SNCC. <laughs> and they, they said, there's a different way we can do this. We can do this in the street. For, for a generation before that, it was Ida B. Wells. Before Ida B. Wells, it was Ann Julia Cooper. You know, I mean, it was everyone, there's a group that says, can we do this differently? And we have to listen to that. And, you know, Frederick Douglass was a part of that group that said, I can't get with what you are saying in your church. Do you see the lashes on his back and my back? I'm sorry. I, I need a message and a ministry that is connected to a liberating gospel, not one that looks like uh, the truncated gospel of, of the people who wanted to keep us enslaved. Frederick Douglass said, I prayed many a years, and I finally got an answer to my prayer when I learned how to pray with my feet. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and um, we have... Uh, time because somebody up here held the mic too long and talked too long. <laughs> Hi, my name is Thomas Bowen. Uh, but we're going to uh, take and try to squeeze in at least one question. One? Yes, we have time for one uh, question. Who's going to hit the lottery? I, I recognize when hands go up. Who has a question? Yes, in the back there. Certainly. So the question is, um, the influence of my father uh, and that he had on, on me, and uh, there's probably no other person, it's, it's my mother and my father, who've had the, the biggest influence on me. Um, number one, my father demonstrated that there is, it is not an oxymoron to be a pastor, a father, and a husband. My father was consistent. My father loves some Edwina Moss. That's my mama. I mean, he loves my mama. He still looks at her like, you are the most amazing woman I've ever seen in my life at 89. It's a beautiful thing to see. That's what I saw from my father. The, the second piece was his deep devotion and consistency and care. He has such a gentle, he is a true gentleman, but he has a, he has a gentle heart in terms of his communication and his deep love for people. Um, but he also taught me about Thurman, is where I learned about Thurman. We would drive, literally drive into DC for stuff, and you know, everybody else, they listening to music. What do we listen to? Thurman tapes, you know, <laughs> listen to Howard Thurman on the way. Um, but became an incredible blessing uh, in, in my life understanding that what he would say is that Southern culture is black culture. Sitting on the porch and the food that is created and the wisdom that is shared, the communities that are created, that there is a deep spirituality, the power of silence, uh, the power of, of prayer, that in everything you get glimpses of God. Like he told me something and, and I never forget, he, when he was preaching something, it was real powerful. He said, Otis, you never want to climb a tree that's never been in a storm because the branches aren't strong enough to carry your weight. Because after it's been in the storm, the, de this, the roots go deeper and the branches become stronger. 
the storm is a natural part of the tree's development. I mean, that's, that's southern wisdom. I mean, that's just the wisdom of observing the world, observing creation. And I'm going to give you this sermon. I, this is one of my favorite sermons by my dad. It's real easy. It's real easy. But it is the, because I really think there's nobody who can preach like him because he's an assassin when he preaches. Because he, I mean, he is. It's like he just aims, boom. And you're like, oh, gosh. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's just like you know, other people are like working hard. He just going to take his time and just do his thing. And he's going to sit down. And, that, and that's it. So we were at St. Paul Baptist Church, St. Paul Community Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York. A gentleman by the name of Johnny Ray Youngblood was the pastor. My father was doing the anniversary. Uh, they were classmates for their doctoral program that was led by a person by the name of Dr. Sam DeWitt Proctor. Uh, it was Johnny Ray Youngblood. It was Frank uh, Reed. It was uh, Jeremiah Wright. I mean, Wright. Uh, it, was like, it was like this... Just all, it was the all star team of preaching basically um, at, at that time. So he preaches this sermon and it was entitled God's Care from Eagles to Sparrows. And, um, you know, uh, they shall mount up with wings as eagles, was part of the text. And he said, he started off by explaining the, the power of the eagle. He said, an eagle can fly high, can fly, can soar low. Uh, it's a majestic and beautiful and powerful bird. Then he said this. He said, there's something unique about eagles. He said, eagles are unlike any other bird because the male eagle, when he finds a sister eagle, he never gets divorced. He said, he's so committed to her that he spends time raising the little eaglets. He said, hmm, brothers, you need to be like an eagle. <laughs> we need some committed eagle men. Oh, oh my God, I mean, we, we already, we're already going in at that point. He's just, he's just talking, he's just talking. He said, but, but, but there's, the move was this, but there's some things eagles can't do. He said, eagles can fly high and soar low, but eagles cannot fly far. He said, I was in a bookstore and I found a book that said, why geese fly farther than eagles. And he said this, he said, the reason that geese can fly far is because they know how to work together. They create a formation and they flap their wings and it creates this aerodynamic uh, situation where they can rest on the, wing, on the wind of what someone else creates. And so if the, the head goose gets, gets tired, uh, all he has to do is just float on the wind created by the other geese. And if one of, of, of the geese, they, they, they get injured and they have to go down to the ground, they never go alone. There's another goose that's going to stay with them until they get better. And, and he said they can fly from the northernmost portion of Canada to the southernmost portion of South America. He said they can fly far, uh, farther than eagles. He said, you need to be like an eagle, but we've got to have some, some geese sensibility. When black folk have a geese mentality, what's going to happen in our community? Oh, my gosh. We were, oh, he, he worked that thing. He just worked that thing. But then he said this. This is the final move. He said, eagles can fly high and soar low. Geese can fly far from the northernmost tip to the southernmost tip. Um, but there's some things that eagles can't do and geese can't do. And he pauses, and my dad's good for pauses, uh, and he says, if you want a song, you got to go down by the brook and talk with the sparrow. Then he ended with, his eye <laughs> is on the sparrow. I sing because I'm happy. <laughs> I sing because, then had the nerve to say this, and Maya Angelou says, I know why the caged birds sing. Oh my God, the place was destroyed. <laughs> but that was the kind of theology and spirituality that, uh, that he uh, was always promoting and putting forth. The simplicity and yet the complexity of the depth of creation, nature, and knowing observation and finding those moments where the, the wink and the grace of God is always present in everything that, that one 
encounters, but you just have to find it. So th thank you for that question. Yeah. Uh, ushers, ushers, please come get the offering. <laughs> Doors of the church are open. We have one more time for one more question. Yes. He's still Baptist. I'm still Baptist. Yeah, still Baptist. Still Baptist. Uh, Trinity made it very easy because Trinity is like a, a Baptocostal. It's really funny because people don't even know like what denomination we are. They're like, we UCC? I, I thought, I, what are we? You know, people really don't know because of the, 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 the liturgical way in which the church functioned. And, and Dr. Wright was very good at saying that there is a black spirituality that we want to be rooted in. And the only major, because I came from a, such a very progressive uh, Baptist church, um, because when I went to Morehouse, I did not know, so for, I didn't know that they were like conservative Baptist people. See, I thought that women were supposed to be deacons, and I thought they were supposed to be men. I, that's what I, I just, I thought that was normative. I go to school and I find out there's people called evangelicals. I was like, who are you people? I didn't know who, you, I didn't know who they were. I honestly thought they were just like, okay, there's a black church, then there's other churches. Um, so that was my first encounter with this, the depth of conservatism within, within, our, within our tradition. And coming to Chicago, because the church had such a gumbo of people. So there's this large portion of Trinitarians who, grew, who are Catholic and are now part of Trinity. Then there's this other portion of Baptists who are now Trinity. Then we got this whole crew of holiness people. You know, the, the, the holiness, you don't know the holiness people, they're like holiness. Now, that's not Pentecostal, that's holiness. The holiness is different from Pentecostal. And then we got this Pentecostal crew uh, that uh, is a part, and it makes this beautiful hodgepodge where uh, the two traditions, the tradition of going from Baptist going to UCC, was, uh, was very easy. Now, going to denominational meetings was funny because that was so radically different. I'm like, so you all have your denominational meeting for the national on the weekend? We got church on Sunday. We, we ain't not, no, we're not going. It's a black, we got to be a church. You know, it was, just, it was just certain cultural, very East Coast things that they were, you know, ex, you know, talking about. You know, the idea of saying amen was like shocking at a denominational meeting. Yeah. You know, we, 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 what would you say amen for? You're like, you know, are you okay? You know, it's like, no, 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 that's what we do. Uh, so that was really, that, that's always been a fascinating aspect of the wider denomination is primarily German evangelical, uh, 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 a good portion of people who are Swedish who came into the denomination. And then you have this southern stream of black people in Virginia, North Carolina that were part of um, uh, the congre uh, congregational movement um, that presents very Baptist and Pentecostal. He did. He did. He did. He, he wanted me, but I was, I said no. Um, and the reason being is because I would have always been Little Otis. That's when I go to Cleveland, everybody's like, hey, Little Otis. It was like, you know, I, you know, I'm taller than everybody, you know, Little Otis, you know. Um, but the, the challenge of when you are following someone you deeply love, deeply respect, um, and it is also your father, is that you, you have to be careful about merging and becoming that individual. Um, and, and it happens often in churches where uh, fathers and mothers want their children to follow, and their children, well, one, because they, they wanted them to, and the children really didn't want it, weren't called, and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole other story. But um, 
the challenge of trying to find your own voice is difficult. So I would use the example of Samara Joy, who comes out of a musical family, the McClendons. She develops her voice by not singing in the McClendon group, but still having deep love and singing with the McClendons. But if she sang with the McClendons, we wouldn't know Samara Joy. We wouldn't know her beauty because she would be trying to sing like her, her aunts and her father and her cousins, and she would be trying to find her space in that. And sometimes you have to step out in order to find your full voice. And, and, and finding my voice has been a journey because, you know, I went to the same school my dad did and all that kind of stuff. But um, I have his name too. So finding your voice. So I'm very sensitive about people developing their authentic voice, finding their own voice. I think that's one of the most important things that God, God calls every, everybody has a voice attuned in such a way to communicate and reach a certain group of people. If you try to emulate, become a copy of someone else, copies are always inferior to the original. And so being your authentic self is one of the most important things, but not just in ministry, but in anything that we do. And it's a journey of authenticity that we, we spend the rest of our lives becoming who we are supposed to be. But thank you for that question. <laughs> yeah, I just want to point out that, that, that the oldest in Cleveland went to school with Joe LaVert. That's right. <laughs> high school classmates. Right. That's right. Well, he was, he was ahead of me. He's he was, ahead he of was you. Ahead. Yeah. That's right. Sean was a couple of, uh, who was two years ahead of me. He was the youngest of the LaVerts. Um, and there was a group in Cleveland. It was just called LaVert at the time. And they used to go around to all of the parties and to all of the uh, talent shows, the race tracks. Yeah, and we used to follow them. Um, and then, of course, you know, of course, I mean, I'm 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 a Levert fan, you know, in terms of. If y'all know Levert, look at it, look it up, look it up, look it up, <laughs> look it up. <laughs> Thank you, and God bless. There we go. <laughs> uh, there was... <laughs>